Welcome back to The Mining Pod. To end the show, I'm rejoined by Zach Bradford, CEO of CleanSpark. We talk about market sentiment, ASIC fire sales, mining economics, and what to expect from all the Chapter 11 bankruptcy filings. The future of digital asset mining calls for top technical talent. Enhance your ASIC education with Foundry's hands-on courses. Led by veteran industry instructors, Foundry's three-day mining intensive and five-day mining technician academy programs cover a range of topics, from identifying issues and troubleshooting common hardware failures to coursework covering Bitcoin's global impact. Open to enthusiasts and professionals alike, visit www.foundryacademy.com to learn more and sign up for the course that's right for you. Zach, welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Uh, it's been, you know, two months maybe since I saw you last. So it's great to see you again. And a lot has changed since we last talked. Uh, I mean, how many names can we just list in Chapter 11 bankruptcy right now? Uh, quite a bit. Uh, you guys are, again, like exceeding your expectations, uh, actually revising your forecast for Exahash upwards. Uh, you guys continuous continuously seem to be doing better uh, and we'll get into that in a little bit for the strategy portion but first of all welcome back to the show hey thanks will happy to be here always good to talk awesome so let's talk about market sentiment to begin with I and mean, we were just talking before the show started about thanksgiving was last week and there was definitely a lot of conversations uh with family members and friends about why did you make me buy that token and uh why did you make me ape into that asic i had a few of those conversations luckily i was spared the most of them, but it sounds like you were not spared at all. Let's get your general reaction to the market sentiment. Uh, BlockFi, as of this morning, actually elected to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. So that's the most fresh wound. We're recording this in the morning of November 28th. But yeah, just get your, your first take on what's been going on. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's definitely been a volatile market, uh, to say the very least, uh, the last couple of days. Absolutely had some of those conversations, like I'm sure, sure many of your listeners did uh, at Thanksgiving. Um, everybody's got the uncle that uh, seems to know everything, right? So, um, I, and I think that what shows, though, is that the conversations are still happening. You know, it's still top of mind, and I think it's a good thing. Um, you know, for most of my conversations were about the difference between Bitcoin and, you know, the rest of cryptocurrencies, because yes, Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, but cryptocurrency is not Bitcoin and all the reasons that that matters. So um, I think it's been a great opportunity to educate people, um, but also to educate them about, you know, we have this decentralized tool in Bitcoin and we've seen people, you know, head right back into centralized finance and put it on exchanges and the exchanges and the centralization is really the problem. So great opportunity to educate people about, you know, not your keys, not your coin, um, help people get off exchange when it's, when it makes sense. And, um, but you know, outside of that, I think everybody's just kind of waiting for, for the next shoe to drop. Um, I, you know, everybody's known BlockFi's bankruptcy was eminent. And so I think it's frankly a bit of a relief now that it's out there, now that the market suggested it and we can just kind of move on. Um, it's, it's definitely a tough spot for, you know, everybody that was using the exchanges. But, you know, an interesting thing that, you know, I'm following pretty closely myself is, you know, what does it mean for Bitcoin price? And what I think we're finding is so often these groups, they had lent out Bitcoin five or six exchanges deep. And so there's not actually a lot of Bitcoin to be fire sold to create liquidity. Um, and, you know, that's that's really where, where the what's created the problem but I think we found a little bit of stability. Um, you know, right now we're trading around 16 and it's not where anybody wants to be. But, you know, of course, we can look back four years and still look at how much better the price has become. So, you know, market sentiment is, is I hope, nearing a, a low. And, you know, I see that as a little bit bullish for, you know, heading into a, a brighter future. I think it's still a little bit of pain to go towards the end of the year. But um, I, I, I personally am feeling really bullish about 23 and uh, think that there's a lot of upside there. Love that. Okay, I want to review a little bit or, and get your, uh, your thoughts on this. What's up with all the Bitcoin companies that are just struggling right now? It seems like there's no place to deploy capital that you're not going to lose that capital. So like for the last two years, we have these lending markets with BlockFi. 
uh, they really pitch themselves as like a Bitcoiner friendly place to put your Bitcoin or put whatever token. They had other tokens on there you could you know, lend against, but Bitcoin specifically. The mining sector, I mean, if you bought mining shares, you're down sometimes 70% if you're doing well. More than that in other cases, Bitcoin itself is down quite a bit. Uh, and any sort of like Bitcoin adjacent industry as well, not doing well. And it's obviously a very cyclical market. But even on top of that, seeing like the Chapter 11 bankruptcy filings from mining companies or from BlockFi, like how do you square that as a CEO? And when you're talking to those uh, in the industry or even like friends and family with Thanksgiving last week, how do you sort of like walk people through where we're at with the market? Yeah, l- let me first address, you know, how exchanges and yield had been done because yield has been something we've actually avoided altogether as a company. I know some people are using it as a tool to finance other aspects. They're lending out their Bitcoin. Um, they're using those cash flows. We've actually avoided it because in order to generate yield, you have to know that the fund or the exchange, they're doing something with it. They're, they're not just going to give you yield to put your coins in cold storage. Um, and, you know, whatever tool you're using for that, um, it has risk. And our feeling has been that the, the risk balance hasn't been where it needed to be. Um, it's not like, you know, I'll call it traditional finance who's had a, a longer testing period. What we have, unfortunately, is a highly volatile asset. And when you have to get fixed rates of return from that, you know, in order to do something with it, you're you're generally betting on either the upside or the downside of the underlying Bitcoin or other coin, right? And and based on that, it means that that firm, whoever's you, you know, using your Bitcoin to generate yield, there's some risk of loss. And, you know, due to the volatility, we felt that that's something to be avoided. Now, unfortunately, there was a lot of companies that were, you know, promising big things and guaranteed returns. Um, And I think that there was some people misled around that. And I think that that's a critical piece uh, of why the exchanges have had so many problems. You know, if they would have just, you know, put your coins in the corner and you know, generated the revenue through maybe trading fees or something like that without promising yield, it's a much safer way to, to manage the, y- your Bitcoin. You know, we even look at Coinbase. Coinbase you know, tried to do a yield product, the SEC stopped them, um, and it ended up being fortunate for them. So they're kind of saved from, from it through regulation. I'm not advocating for regulation, um, over-regulation, um, let's be clear i do think there there's some smart regulation that should occur on the exchange level what that is you know i'm i won't get into because i think it's far too nuanced but i really think that that was a problem is you know in order to generate yield i think that most people didn't realize that they had to you know risk their bitcoin and it may not come back if if things didn't go well um and so i think that that's the the key piece with exchanges now Let's talk mining stocks. Obviously, that's something that, you know, we're directly affected by both from a capital point of view, from a shareholder point of view. So I'm going to just speak broadly about this. And I think that there's been a couple key issues in in the valuation. I think what really happened is as we entered a bear market, the market kind of locked in wherever a company's stock price was. And just looked at what Bitcoin did from there. And we saw a lot of devaluation of stocks from that point. But largely the market hasn't taken, I don't believe, um, into full account, different companies' growth, different companies' power prices, different companies' efficiencies. Um, You know, I'll just point to us uh, as an example in the sense that yes, we, our stock price has dropped significantly. It has dropped less than most of our peers, but I'm, I'm of the opinion, you know, companies like ours and other companies to be clear, haven't gotten credit properly for the growth that we've, we've been able to put on. And you've seen companies that have done, you know, very well and some that have, you know, gone bankrupt. And I think that that's just kind of taken the market with a, Hey, we're going to step back approach and just kind of value these companies based on what Bitcoin does. But there's so many other variables. And I think, unfortunately, we'll probably need to take a little bit of, uh, you know, market change 
towards, uh, you know, another, the next bull market before all the credit comes due. Now with that in mind though, I think we're going to still see a few other companies, you know, not make it through. Um, and you know, it's really going to be the companies that manage well through, you know, early 23, they're going to be identified as the clear winners. And, and I think that that's when valuations will start to, you know, shift back to fundamentals, but until it does, you know, it's just kind of market panic. You know, the average S and P stock is down 30% this year. So it's not just Bitcoin miners. I think we felt a little bit more pain than the rest of the market. Of course, when you look at percentages, um, but we also benefited partially during the, the bull market runs of, you know, the last 12 months. Certainly. And I like the way that you're going to pair those two things differently, because I think a lot of people look at the market, they see Bitcoin, they see a centralized exchange or a lending product, and they see mining and they loop them all together. But there's definitely different pain points for both products. And for whoever invested in those or just looking at them from the sidelines, they are, they are very different and important to uh, disremediate the fundamentals there. Let's dive into the mining sector a little bit more in depth and specifically talk about strategy for clean spark asics facilities deploying capital right now i mean the, the whole premise for this conversation between you and i it's was spun up around like talking about all the the financial panic with miners I and mean, there's been a few companies that have been facing catastrophic wipeouts currently we have machines trading for $15 per tera hash i've even seen as low as $9 per tera hash uh, for some ASICs, I'm sure you have access to way more deal books and, and offers than uh, I'll ever have uh, access to. And so you probably know a little bit more about it than, than I will. But let's get a lay of the land for where the ASIC market is at and where uh, finance or not financing rather, but warehouses and facilities are at in terms of valuations. And then let's talk a little bit about strategy, how you guys are navigating through all the carnage we're seeing out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Let's talk ASICs first. So ASICs, obviously, everybody knows we've been buyers. We bought over 27,000 ASICs over the last, I think, five months, six months since the bear market began. And it's been a big part of our growth. You know, we we started seeking out distressed assets last May. Um, and, you know, I think it was June where we where we pulled off, you know, the first distressed asset purchase with a bunch of XPs. Um, we've since picked up mostly J Pros. And, you know, we're taking a dollar cost average um, view on this. Um, I know that there's, you know, some parties that feel like, hey, let's sit on the sidelines and see where the bottom is. Um, I don't think you're going to find the bottom of this market except in the rearview mirror. And so rather than trying to catch a falling knife, um, we're basically taking it, you know, over time. So we've paid $30 a tera hash, you know, a few months ago. Um, most recently we paid in the first, or I should say most recent large deal we've announced, we've paid $15 a tera hash. We have picked up a few small orders under that, you know, they weren't notable enough for a press release because they're, you know, a few hundred here or there, but we're, you know, looking very closely at some very large opportunities. Um, the key with that is, as part of our dollar cost average, like you said, we we do see a lot of deal flow. Um, I think our phone rings for opportunities um, before a lot of others because we've we've shown ourselves to be one of the only public miners that is actively purchasing. And so as a result, we have seen pricing all over the place. Like you mentioned, nine dollars and up. And you know, there's of course a lot of nuances there. Where's the inventory at? What's it going to cost to ship? What's the sales tax implication? All of those things come into you know effect, and we just kind of take it day by day. Um, I do think that we're going to see a new level of lows in the ASIC market over probably the next sixty days. Um, but from there, I think that you know even the warehoused um, ASICs there's still a bottom for those. There's still a point where, you know, a dealer holds on to them and says, Hey, I spent too much. I'm not going to take a loss. I'm just going to sit on these for, you know, another six months or so until the market comes back. The key thing I think that's going to interrupt that though, is the bankruptcies. So, you know, everybody knows about the bankruptcies that have been announced. Um, and, you know, many of those are going through the process of, sorting through their options and ultimately there's going to be auctions over the next two to three months that have been announced i think they're well known 
Um, I won't say any names on those because I think your viewers probably know who they are. But as those uh, as those auctions, you know, come to fruition, you know, I I do think that just the size of those orders is going to set new lows. Um, and so, but the key with this, an ASIC is definitely valuable, but it's still a paperweight until you can plug it in. And so ultimately, you know, that was the downfall of some of the miners that are in bankruptcy, you know, not all of them, but some of them, they, their infrastructure wasn't ready in time. It didn't have low enough power cost. They couldn't get the economics to service their debt, whatever that is. But ultimately without a plug to plug in that miner, um, it's, it's just an expensive, you know, brick. And so, you know, that's how we're balancing it is. You know, we have a lot of infrastructure under development right now. We have a lot of infrastructure going to 23 and we're probably going to buy a six that'll sit on a pallet for, you know, 30, 60, 90 days when the time is right. But we do take that into account. And, you know, being one of the very few buyers, um, we always prefer to buy miners, you know, and then plug them in right away. So we're, we're not in a rush right now because all of our shelves are full. And we have more shelves coming online next quarter. So it gives us the opportunity. We're going to step back. We're going to wait for the opportunities to present themselves. And then, you know, we have dry powder that we're ready to, to pounce when it does come. So I, I think that that's the key with ASICs is, you know, it's supply and demand. And it's also, you know, comes down to what Bitcoin's doing. I do think we're going to see some players that are interested in expanding with those ASICs um, potentially wait too long. Because if Bitcoin goes on a bull run for whatever reason, um, let's say there's an economic event, whether it's, you know, stock market based or, you know, Fed based, or even if, you know, it's just tax loss selling, you know, rounds itself out through December and there's more buyers now moving back into the market. Um, as soon as Bitcoin prices start to go up, ASIC prices will follow um, and they're always quicker to rise than they are to fall. So we're, like I said, we'll, our, our strategy is just a dollar cost average into it, take it nice and easy um, and meet expectations. And just to reiterate, it also seems to be have a place for that ASICs to go. Uh, at what point would you say like a good price point is just to purchase it with the intention of putting on a shelf, maybe in 180 days, maybe in 90 days, just thinking from a long-term perspective at what price point does the economics make sense for you just to go ahead and purchase that ASIC and even just hold on to it and wait for a shelf to open up? You know, I, I think if you really look at the numbers and where we would project, you know, internally Bitcoin goes over the next year, you know, opportunity cost, I think anything under 13, you know, starts to make sense to kind of hold and wait. Um, obviously if you can get it at nine, that's all the better. But I think that for me right now, that's probably the line in the sand is about $13 a tera hash or, you know, $1,300 roughly for an S19 J Pro. Gotcha. Appreciate that. Let's talk about facilities as well. You guys have moved in. You picked up the former Mossum facility in Georgia. I think you guys have a few others that you guys have picked up. What's the facility landscape look like from dollars per megawatt hour, things of that nature? Is it really bad? Uh, how are those things actually holding some of their value more so than ASICs just because, you know, they have more utility than necessarily just being a facility for mining Bitcoin. Uh, where do you, what are you seeing in terms of like liquidations of facilities? Curious to know more about that because there are a lot of headlines about some of these bigger players that are potentially having to liquidate entire facilities because they don't have good books. Yeah. You know, I, I think facilities, are still in high demand. Um, we have, of course, picked up two of them over the last uh, couple months, one being Moss and another one in Washington, Georgia. I think that the key is, is, you know, twofold. One is facilities that are failing. You have to understand why they failed. Um, because frankly, you know, it could be mismanagement and can it be when managed properly, can it produce profitable income, because that's what we're all here for at the end of the day, under a, a better management, under, uh, you know, new negotiations with the power provider, whatever it may be. And so I think yeah, the, we just have to, you have to go into it knowing that there's, you know, something that broke in, in the process. Um, and frankly, we've said no to a lot more facilities than we've said yes to. And I think that's an important thing is, yes, we've announced two purchases. But both purchases we found, 
you know, were either a profitable from the onset, but also had key things that we can fix. You know, we always take it from an energy first, infrastructure first approach. And, and based on that, with a few tweaks, you can dramatically increase the economics of a site just by properly managing your power, for example. And, you know, but in some locations, you look at a facility and it may have a fundamental flaw. So for example, reasons we've said no to facilities is the actual equipment, infrastructure equipment ratios just didn't make sense. PUE, you know, the basically the efficiency of what it takes to cool a miner down to what actually powers the miner. And if you're looking at a facility and you're spending 30% of your power just getting power to the plug and keeping the miner at school, um, it's, it's a bad bet. So we've said no to a lot of things. So I think, the, interestingly, we're going to find that there are facilities that are on the market that may not sell. And if they don't sell, then what next? Um, and maybe with a low enough, you know, purchase price, you know, you kind of have to wipe, if there's an ability to wipe the board and rebuild using their, their key things, um, the underlying power agreement, for example. But, you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of facilities, I think, that have come on the market. It just depends on which ones failed for a reason that they should have failed. And I think that saying no um, is just as important as saying yes when it comes to purchasing. Um, you know, right now, we're, we're, you know, we've made it public that we're in the hunt. And so I'm probably looking at a facility, you know, once a week. Um, but we're saying, we're saying no a lot because there's definitely some facilities that were built haphazardly and without a lot of forethought. So, but the facilities that are quality, I do think will keep their value. Um, I think that the biggest change in infrastructure we're seeing right now is, you know, during the height of the bull market, you could sell a piece of dirt next to a substation and say, yeah, figure it out, but the power's there and you get millions of dollars for that piece of dirt. Um, gone are those days. You better have something that can deliver value in order to get a buyer. In terms of like a Goldilocks situation for CleanSpark, what are you guys looking for in terms of cost for the facility? Maybe, which is build one right now on the podcast, right? Like if it's already built, it has energy at the plug, it's connected to the grid, you have a, a power agreement that you can just scoop up along with it, and you just need to put ASICs into the facilities. What sort of price points are you looking at in order to secure this asset? Yeah, you know, we, we've been looking at all ranges. So, you know, for, for us, if you can acquire a facility for, you know, fully built, ready to go around 300,000 or less per megawatt right now, that's what we're looking for. Um, you know, I would uh, tell you that those price points were different even three months ago. So I do think there's probably 25% of the value that's been shaved from a facility purchase price in the last six months, but there's still a lot of value because a well-built facility you know, the transformers, the switch gear, the shelving, the, you know, exhaust fans, whatever it may be, the data center, the dirt, there's still a lot of value there. Now, I think that there's still a ways to go. And for certain facilities, if you look at the materials they used, it's maybe it's only worth 200,000 a megawatt. And, you know, for a facility that's, you know, poorly built, you have to do maybe a Band-Aid rip off and, you know, take it from the transformers over and rebuild. Maybe it's 100,000 a megawatt, right? So, but ultimately all that value does drive back to the, the power agreement. Um, we're of course, big fans of Georgia. We understand Georgia's power. We understand how the markets work. We understand how to manage through it. Um, but ultimately, you know, right now, mining economics are, you know, you have to be, you know, power prices under that seven cent range. And in our, in our facilities, in our, in Georgia, we've been able to achieve that consistently and month over month, every time. So we do like Georgia, but if I was to look outside of Georgia, that's really the key is every penny you go below seven cents increases the value. And so we, of course, you know, like sites that, you know, can be four cents and below. I think that that's going to be a critical point as we approach having. And, um, you know, if you can take a manage through it and produce at the end of the year, an average price point in that range, I think that you have a good side on your hands. Um, and, and I think that that's kind of where, where, where we're looking at sites. If it's, you know, significantly above four, you know, it starts to lose value up to seven. Then at seven, of course, there's, you know, not a lot of value left on the bone. 
And so there would have to be something else that would, would drive that, such as the ability to go purchase a hedge for that facility or something like that. So, but yeah, there, I think there's getting to be some pretty big lines in the sand about where power prices and economics ultimately, you know, land at. Let's turn over to financing. And I have a, definitely have a few questions about this topic, maybe for clean spark, maybe not, maybe we can just generalize a little bit more. So how would you navigate the financing market right now? Because a lot of people would love to have, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars lying around or a few million dollars lying around to go purchase a facility, but most people don't. So how do you go out into finance markets, secure capital, turn around and deploy it in the midst of this carnage? Honestly, I'm going to keep using that word because that's what we're seeing right now. Uh, Clean Spark luckily is in a position where you're public. You guys have equity. You guys have outstanding track record. So probably the financing markets aren't too difficult. But for someone who's out there looking at the markets, how would you suggest to them or advise them to move strategically when purchasing up either ASICs or facility? We take it either way, whatever is an easier example. I, I think one thing's been made really clear in our market. The debt markets have not matured to where they need to be. Um, in an industry like ours, where you're asset heavy, you have the assets directly contributing cash flow, you know, from a theoretical sense, you know, debt would be a good tool. Um, we have taken on less than you know, right now we have $18 million roughly of debt, you know, plus or minus a million. And that ultimately has put us in a really good spot because with over 400 million of assets, you know, we're free and clear. We don't have debt service issues, things like that. You look at other players who have, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of debt, and now the economics have changed. Um, the instruments that funded those underlying debts aren't sophisticated. They're, they're, they're not built for the Bitcoin markets. They're, they're a little too traditional. They also, most of the instruments that are being offered out there, they had very high interest rates. You know, 16% was, is something that was commonly, you know, people were taking. And they were also too short, two-year terms. That means you have to pay back all the debt and all the interest in, you know, half of the lifespan of an ASIC. Um, the, light, the length of those debts needs to mature to where it can match the life of an ASIC. And it needs to have, you know, maybe some built-in, you know, terms and flexibility when economics change. Because a debtor doesn't want to come in and repossess machines at the end of the day. Um, again, they're picking up things they have to put in a warehouse and hope for a better time, or they have to sell them at losses usually. Um, so I, debt, I think is just not mature enough. Hopefully someday it will be, which is why we've only taken a little bit. Um, and I, you know, obviously debt's the leading cause of all the bankruptcies right now. I really do believe that there are two more levers you can pull. One is Bitcoin. We of course sell our Bitcoin all the time. Um, it's an indirect way to hedge your Bitcoin. Instead of putting it in something that there is an actual hedge, you just sell it. We're here to run a business. That means we need to turn over the revenues that we create back into cash, reinvest that cash to pay our bills and to grow. And that's where we lean first is let's grow through our Bitcoin. Um, and then lastly, we do of course look to equity. Now I think equity is the right tool in the current market. Um, you know, people talk about dilution and where the stock price is, but I think that you have to put it in perspective. Um, you know, even though most miners are down as much as 80%, and I'm speaking in a general sense at this point, you look at ASIC prices from one year ago, they are down 90%. That means if you measured in most cases, the sell of or the purchase of an ASIC in the number of shares it would have taken to buy that ASIC, you're actually using less shares, even at current market values. And for us, that's a very important ratio to look at because if I can go buy a miner for $1,300 instead of $10,000, yes, my stock might be down, but if it's down less than the ASIC prices are, that means it's still the right move. Um, and so that's, that's how we're looking at it. We also look at any sort of equity that we deploy. And I think this is the right mindset for any company is, is it making the pie bigger? You know, dilution is, is looked down on usually, 
But if the pie got bigger and the pieces also got fractionally bigger that everybody gets, then it's a good thing. So we, you know, I'm, I'm one of the largest shareholders of the company. I take dilution very seriously because it matters to me just as much as it does to anybody. And, and I look at it that way. If, if I can, you know, increase the value of the company more than the shares that go out the door, then it's really accretive. It's not dilutive. And, and that's how we look at it. We're also have always done this and this is why we sell our Bitcoin. We think it's our obligation to run the company as profitably as possible. That means that we shouldn't be using equity on a regular basis to pay our bills. That's what the Bitcoin's for. So as long as we maintain that strategy, um, we think that equity is the right tool for creative growth. Yeah, I love what you said there about the equity using it for growth. I just had Riot and Marathon on this podcast last few weeks and they both took some shareholder votes recently, Riot approving to increase shareholder votes in order to basically fund its new development and the Marathon shareholders actually saying no to more dilution. So we'll see what happens with those two stories, but it's important to note them. I actually want to take this last question a little bit uh, different direction. In terms of Chapter 11 news, we've been seeing, you know, it's been devastating for the market and a lot of people have been caught off guard I and mean, they might have invested in these stocks or maybe they're just interested in them. And we all know the names, so no reason to go over them again. From your perspective, though, as someone who's been in the industry for a while and has experience with these things, what are you expecting next? Like you saw, you said earlier, auctions for ASICs, maybe au- auctions for facilities. A lot of people are holding with bated breath what's going to occur with these large public miners who are now in Chapter 11. What is your perspective on what the next eight to 12 weeks holds for them? You know, I, I think that it's going to, for many of them um, that declared ch- Chapter 11, their debtors are going to get most of it because their debtors probably in, in many of these cases, their debtors own or are owed more value than the assets are worth. Um, that's not all, always the case. Um, some entities I think will navigate through it. They'll be able to come out kind of refreshed with renegotiated debt terms that actually work from a cash flow. Because sometimes it's just a structure problem. The debtor ultimately wants to be fully repaid. The miner wants to service those debts and keep all their shareholders intact. But that does come to a a meeting of the minds is needed where both parties can actually see the eventual outcome. And, and, you know, some of these debts, I do believe, can be restructured in a way where both parties get what they need. But that's not the case. And so we're either going to see full and complete liquidations or at least partial liquidations um, to satisfy some of these debtors. You know, importantly, too, that, you know, some of the debtors have now also declared bankruptcy. BlockFi is kind of the easy example because they declared bankruptcy. So if you owe debt to BlockFi now and you're both in bankruptcy, um, there's there's maybe a chance that the bankruptcies work together, but there's maybe even a greater chance that, you know, depending on where the trustees are at and how deep the whole, you know, BlockFi is in, they just may be looking for as much cash as they can get right now. And that may trigger ultimately a liquidation of some kind, whether it's ASICs or, you know, something else. What, what is interesting is most of these debts, not all, but most are secured by the ASICs. So there's also the potential where, you know, we, we've seen this happen recently with, with one miner, of course, won't name them because I think everybody knows they put all their miners in a special vehicle they defaulted on the loan. And now what they have is they have a facility that's essentially empty. I think that we're going to see at least a few of those. Um, and then it'll be interesting. It'll be up to that miner to decide, hey, I have you know empty shelf space. I'm going to rebuild. Or are they going to become hosts? Or what's going to happen? And I, I think we're going to see that happen to multiple miners out there. Um, what I can tell you is hopefully you know we'll be involved in, in the buying. Um, we, we really do believe, you know, in win-wins wherever we can structure it. So hopefully there's a way that, that, you know, we can bring our buying power into this and, you know, everybody wins. 
last question for you, just to follow up on that one. What does this mean for the Bitcoin network in general? We're expecting a 10% decrease in difficulty this week. Again, we're recording on the 28th, so it'll be happening pretty shortly here. But what are you expecting in terms of difficulty? And are you expecting it to continue going down as more of these facilities come offline? Or do you think we're sort of hitting like a pretty steady point? You know, it's it, that's it, there's a few nuances to it. So um, I do think that we're going to see some decreases in difficulty. Um, you know, I think that this most recent change that's coming up, it was a little bit delayed. I think there's always going to be a delay in difficulty because I think when the drop from 20 to 16 happened, there were at least some miners who it was no longer economically feasible for them to mine, but they just kind of held on tight. They said, hey, mate, let's let's run a week see if it comes back. When it didn't come back, they eventually turned off. And so, you know, I think it's pretty clear what caused this most recent decrease is people finally waving the flag. Um, I think there's maybe a few more that will come offline. But also when you consider bankruptcy, um, it adds a very different element because some of these miners, you know, they have to turn off because it's not profitable. Other ones, you know, they are profitable. And the reason they're having issues is because they're struggling to pay their bills um, as a result of debt service. Well, once you move into bankruptcy, the bankruptcy court can basically say, hey, we need to preserve cash flows. And at least for some period of time, the debt holders don't get paid, but the trustee will, or the company, depending on how it's structured, will be allowed to continue to run. So a company that you know couldn't pay its bills because of the debt service can now pay its energy bill. It can now do, you know generate positive cash flows, and the debtors are just kind of sidelined. That means that there are some facilities that would have been turned off that will stay running. So I don't think we're going to see you know a huge drop, but I do think we'll see a little bit. So kind of seeing you know eight or nine percent you know falling in the next one, um, and you know hopefully a few more percentage points throughout December. You know, power prices, of course, nationwide are likely going to come up as the winter gets colder. Just that's just how economics work with natural gas prices. So I think that, that that'll also be a cause. Um, but, you know, stepping back, even with this drop in difficulty, what I think is fundamentally important is it shows how healthy actually the Bitcoin network is. You know, we're talking about it dropping, you know, 240 exa hash instead of, you know, higher. But 240 exahash is still a very robust network. It's still very distributed. It's still very healthy. So really, you know, Bitcoin itself is healthy, regardless of whether we're seeing 10 or 5% drops in difficulty or even increases. I, I think that that's what's fundamentally important. And that, that's ultimately what's critical for miners and holders of Bitcoin is how healthy the network is. So very robust network, very happy with where, you know, the, the network ultimately is pointing right now. Yeah, I'm pretty curious to see what happens over the next few weeks, not only for these bankruptcies and what happens with all the, the miners who are going through that, if they're going to stay online or not, but also just I think you get a good baseline over the next few weeks what this bear market's going to look like in terms of mining economics. But we shall see. Zach, thank you so much for joining the Mining Pod. Really appreciate your time and your insights into the ASIC markets, facilities, liquidations, Chapter 11, and much more. Thank you so much. Hey, appreciate it. Thanks, Will. Always good to be here.